uh, last week, and here's the sunshine again. A little crisp on a fall day, so it's nice to see you. If you're on the hill, let me remind you, go ahead and turn your headlights off. As always, uh, they will go off, but then you'll have to have your car jump started when you finish. So thank you for going ahead and doing that. You know, we celebrate uh, with our friends at Carpenter's Hands. Many of you, some of you have been a part, uh, several of you have been a part of Carpenter's Hands Missions Ministry and in partnership with Mud Creek Baptist Church. They had their big sale yesterday, and we celebrate with them. I think they raised in one day, uh, and plus they had some big ticket items, but about $68,000 for missions for next year. So God has a great big plan, we know, uh, for that uh, next year. And who knows what that's going to be, but God already has plans for that. We're excited to celebrate that with them. Again, many thanks to uh, our homecoming committee last week who did a wonderful and beautiful job uh, in helping feed everyone and get all the food prepared and getting everything together last week. It was truly a great day uh, to be able to worship together. And uh, on next Sunday, uh, in the afternoon, you know, we celebrate good things around here. Uh, our youth minister, Joshua, and his dear wife, Natalie, as you know, are on their way to parenthood. And so we're excited for them. And uh, next Sunday afternoon, uh, from 2 until 3.30, you'll have an opportunity to bless them and shower them with blessings. Uh, and uh, that'll be here on the back porch. You'll be able to drive through and uh, drop your gift and greet them. Uh, and shower them with love and, uh, and good wishes uh, as they're awaiting their new baby in October, <clears throat> just around the corner. So uh, good and exciting things are coming. I'll remind those uh, of our children that we will have uh, an opportunity for children to slip out a little bit later in service today. You'll be uh, meeting with your children's teachers and slipping around to the front side of the building uh, for our children's lesson. Then later we'll have adult Bible study right here on the back porch, ladies study here, youth study will be, uh, you'll find Joshua and he will uh, find a sunny spot for you guys as well. So uh, as we're moving back together and uh, moving back into groups, uh, you find your place for a good Bible study this morning as well. God has brought us here to worship. Are you ready to do that? I'll let you stand and greet one another with a hearty hug, uh, not a hug, not a handshake. <laughs> How about a hearty wave and smile to your neighbor nearest you, if you would do that at this time. And then let's worship through singing, shall we? And we know that in every circumstance that God will make a way for he is good all the time. And all the time he is good. good. Amen. Amen.
Will you join me as we pray together? Holy Father, I thank you that you work in all things for the good of those who love you, those who are called according to your purposes. Your word tells us just that. And we come declaring our faith, declaring our hope, declaring our trust, and understanding that you are good all the time, and all the time you are good. We come into the beauty of this place, this great outdoor surrounding this morning, the sun warming our faces, and Lord, your spirit warming our hearts. It is good to be in this place, and we declare that it is good to be in your presence. And Father, we thank you for how you have held us, how you have guided us, how you have walked with us uh, through even the valleys of shadows in this past week. And we pray for those who continue to walk through those valleys. We pray that your encouragement and your hope and your presence and your help would be so near to them. And Father, today, would you teach us what it means to truly walk with you in all the ups and downs of life and the good times as well as the not so good times. Would you teach us that you are a God who enters into our uh, world, Lord, you have come in the person of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, which means God with us. You have put on flesh and come and dwelt among us. You have showed us how to live and how to love. Lord, we come before you this morning humbly realizing that our sins are forgiven through Christ and his blood. Not anything that we have done ourselves, but that which you have done for us. And so we receive that gift once again in a fresh new way. We confess to you that we have fallen far short of your glory. But Lord, it is not we ourselves and our glory that matter anyway. It's your glory. And so we come to give you glory. We come to, uh, Lord, be lifted above the fray, above the things of this world, that we might gain a heavenly perspective and a spiritual insight to the world in which we live. We ask that you would teach us how to live in these days of great challenge. You would teach us to be people of light. And where there is darkness, oh Father, may we be bringers of light. May we be those who push back the darkness day by day and moment by moment. Beginning in our own homes, in our own world, our own community. We pray, Father, that this church might be continually a light set on a hill as a city that cannot be hidden, that we might bring the light and hope of Christ to the world around us and to the world beyond us. I pray that you would raise up a new generation of those who love you in undeniable faith, in unshakable faith, that they would walk in your ways, that they would give testimony that you are good. Father, we come before you this morning just simply to worship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And let us sing that beautiful name. Let us lift high the name of Jesus as we declare his praises together.
That's a great message to share, isn't it? It's a tremendous message to share. The great name of Jesus Christ has the power to save. I want to invite our children at this time, those who would like to slip out. You're welcome to go with Miss Celeste and just make your way. Celeste, you want to come? You can come right on through. This is Celeste Mays. She's going to make her way right across the camera. Say hello to everyone. Celeste, there you go. <laughs> All right, children, you're welcome to slip out at this time. And uh, our children's teachers, you're welcome to go. You know, life is good most of the time, right? Most of the time. God is good all the time. But life, well, you know. And uh, we have, in the, the fall season, we have all lamented not having the, the wonderful Apple Festival. Uh, or at least I have. But I did get to make my way over to the Apple Orchard yesterday. And on the way into the Apple Orchard, Melissa and I took a, an hour and rode over to the Apple Orchard. And uh, someone was walking out carrying an apple cider donut. Now, I just have to tell you, if, if you have sworn off sweets, this will change your mind. And uh, so I said, it's going to be a good day, you know, because wherever that apple cider donut came from, I'm going to find that location. And so, you know, there, we walked up and there were lots of apples everywhere, of course, and we came to get apples. But I did find... Uh, and, and you follow your nose and the signs and you will find the apple cider donut window and so i found that and uh on the way that it was still warm you understand what i'm saying it was still warm like it was good it was like just really crusty on the outside and just soft and melt in your mouth on the inside if you ever had an apple cider donut you really need to have one before you die if you don't not a lot just one. One will do. Um, life is good. You know, I was reminded of that. But life also can certainly turn so quickly, can it? I mean, we, there's, there's this constant good and not so good that we experience in life. And sometimes life is really not good. Sometimes there are things that happen that are really hard and really difficult. And as God's people, sometimes we struggle with that. Because if God is good all the time, then why is my life not always apple cider donut good? You know, we struggle with that. Why is it sometimes really, really bad? And why do really hard things happen? And we struggle with those two hands of life that we are constantly left to deal with and it's not this is not anything new by the way it's not anything new but yet we have to find our way into how to make sense of that you know just this past week on friday one of henderson county's finest young law enforcement officers ryan hendrix was hendrix was laid to rest and that was a very difficult thing for our community and yet in the midst of that great loss jesus was praised and it was a beautiful time of, of worship, even in a time of loss. It was a time of loss, not just for his family, but for our community and our county, and for those who work so closely with him. And it was evidenced by their words, as so many spoke kind words at his funeral and words of how his life had impacted theirs. And so we have this, uh, these good times remembered and celebrated, but we also have this sadness of grief and loss. We have those two hands that uh, we deal with on a daily basis. This morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. When loss happens, how do you handle that? And I need to give you one more psalm. There's so many psalms. There's 150. We could spend 150 Sundays and just walk through all of them, and I've really enjoyed it. Maybe we'll get back to psalms next Sunday. We're going to move into a series called Great People and those who shape them, the influencers. So I hope you'll, you'll kind of get yourself ready for that. But today I want to, to ask the question, what do we do when loss happens? How do we handle that? This would be one of the most practical lessons that you've had in a long time. And it's one that you're gonna need from time to time as you go throughout your life. Um, when loss happens to, an, to us, inevitably something else follows. As sure as night follows day, when loss happens, grief follows loss. 
They say, well, what is grief? Well, definitions vary a lot, but my definition goes something like this. Grief is the emotional, uh, social, mental, physical, and spiritual reaction to the loss that has just occurred. It affects every facet of your life. And it includes both a me and a we element. Loss always does. It's not just an individual thing. It's also a community. It's sometimes a family thing. It's a, it's a social thing. It's a me and a we. There's a collective aspect. And it's undeniable. It's uncontrollable. Grief happens following a loss. And so how do we make our journey through that? We've been talking uh, a lot about this journey called life for several weeks, and we've learned a lot about singing our way through the ups and downs, the joys and the sorrows, the highs and lows. We've seen Moses singing and Miriam and, uh, singing after a great victory. We've seen David singing and many of his psalms we've explored together. Uh, we've seen Jesus singing even on the night that he was betrayed. Uh, he was singing there in the upper room with his disciples. Uh, we've seen Paul and Silas singing in prison in the deepest, darkest dungeon. We've seen them singing psalms and hymns to God. And so we've seen a lot of people singing. And God's people are singing people. Usually. <laughs> usually we are. But not always. Unless we're singing people. Unless a loss occurs that is so overwhelming that results in grief so deep that one may lose his or her song for a while. You know, I, 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 this happened, it really, in Psalm 137, if you want to go ahead and turn there, Psalm 137, we're going to look into this psalm. It's a song of grief, and this loss uh, is written out of a time of loss that happened to the entire nation of Judah after Jerusalem fell. They lost not only their holy city, Jerusalem, but their temple, Solomon's beautiful temple that had been built for magnificent worship. They lost their way of life, their freedom. Many family members and friends died in the loss of that city uh, and, and uh, were killed. Uh, many who, of uh, the best and brightest who survived were taken captive down to another country called Babylon. And there they lived for some 70 years. Now, loss happens for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's expected, it's planned, it's normal, it's natural. And even though it's expected, sometimes it's difficult. But sometimes it's unexpected or unplanned. And it may or may not be our fault. In this case, the loss was a complete loss of a way of life. And it came as a result of God's people having turned away from him. Even though he sent prophet after prophet to tell them to turn back to God, there was a time when God said, enough. He allowed them to be taken captive down into Babylon. And there they realized what they had lost. And when they realized what they had lost, they understood how truly valuable and how truly great it was. They mourned for what they had lost. This psalm, Psalm 137, is a loss for the is a psalm for those who mourn. It's a psalm for those who grieve. It's a psalm for those who have experienced loss due to evil and cruelty and inhumanness of others. This psalm you'll hear the heart of those who grieve. And more than that, this morning I pray that you will find instruction and direction and understanding that will inform you both now and in the future when you find yourself in a place or a time of grief. Let's read this psalm together. You'll hear in it the heart of those who grieve. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion, that is that beautiful city of God, there on, our, on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. 
May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. O daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction, Happy is he who repays you for what you have done to us. He who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. That's a tough ending to a psalm. It's a psalm that calls for retribution and justice. It's a psalm that reminds us of all that's been lost. Can I make a few observations first? about how grief affects us and they come through so clearly if you read this psalm very slowly and just allow it to surface a few observations about grief and the grieving heart is that first of all grief stops us grief is one of the things in life that stops us it causes us to pause activity it causes us to put down what we're doing and to reflect for just a minute on what has happened the writer of the psalm says, there by the rivers of Babylon, we did what? We sat down. We stopped. When we did what? When we remembered. We wept. Psalm, uh, this psalm teaches us not only that grief uh, stops us in our tracks, it also brings tears there. We wept. This is not just a few tears. This is tears of a deeply grieving heart. Grief brings tears, a language of the grieving. It causes us to remember we wept when we remembered Zion, what we once had, and it causes us to give great value to what we have lost. It causes us to appreciate and to understand and gives perspective to all that we have once had and held dear and they remember zion and their hearts break grief does that to us it causes us to remember and appreciate and fifthly it causes us to want to hang up our hearts grief does that for a time it causes us to want to hang up our hearts and stop our songs and it may cause us to be resentful toward others who perhaps have been a part of our loss or it may cause us to be bitter it may cause us to want justice and those aren't bad things how you handle them is important how you handle them is important you see, this psalm reminds me that as it is inspired word of God, it reminds me that I can sing and share and express my heart to God in a real and sometimes raw way. Loss does something. It takes us to a foreign land, a place that's unfamiliar, whether in reality or metaphorically. In this case, the people of God have been literally, many of them have been literally taken down to Babylon, a foreign land. And all the familiar was gone around them. And it's hard to sing in a foreign land when everything seems unfamiliar. You say, well, I, I know and I understand why the Israelites refused to sing. They were unable and unwilling to sing the songs of the Lord among ungodly people. Can you imagine tormentors who brought them in and said, or who came down to the river and said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Entertain us with some of your songs. How terrible is that? How embittering is that? And they would not offer that which was sacred to idols. You can sense a return, even through this psalm, you can sense a return of their absolute devotion to the Lord and the sacred things of the Lord. And they said, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? We know this, that loss can rip the song right out of our hearts. You know, I recall our first gatherings here when we first began to regather, and we had kind of been away from each other. We had been at home, and just kind of COVID had kind of just sent us all to our 
separate quarters, if you will. You remember the first time we came in together? Wasn't it kind of hard to sing? Did you find it? I mean, I just felt like when we invited you to sing, there was just this moment. It's like, man, I just don't have a song in me. Were you there? Maybe it was just me. Maybe I just felt that. But it was kind of like the first Sunday we came back together, even as collective worship, even though we were outdoors, it was like, I just, I don't have a song. I think we feel that. And we can identify with that. Everything around us has changed. Loss can steal your song for a while, but can I ask you to do something for me? Well, really for yourself. When loss happens, go ahead and sit down and weep. It's all right to do that. And if for a while you need to hang up your harp on a poplar, hang it up in plain sight so that you will constantly be reminded that once you had a song and once you sang, and that once again in the future you will sing. Don't throw your harp in the river, okay? Don't break it up and shatter it into pieces. Just hang it up, if only for a while, and hang it in plain view so you will see it as a constant reminder that you sang once and you will sing again. Loss causes us to evaluate what's important, to value what matters, to use a word from 2020 to understand what's really essential. For example, this year we've learned that to worship God, we don't need an air-conditioned building, although it's nice to have one <laughs> behind us. In fact, we might need one with heat soon, uh, right? Uh, but we've learned that we can worship God, you know, all summer like many others around the world do outdoors, you know? Uh, while I was in India many years ago, we worshiped in outdoor settings, and it was a beautiful thing. It has been here. We've gained a better understanding that the church is not bricks and mortar, but it's the people, it's you, it's me, that make up this body. And though we've lost much this year, we have not lost the Spirit of God and the people of God who carry that within themselves. And so we are the church in community. And so when we go back inside... You know, a little while, let's not forget the world outside or forget our purpose as God's people to be the church and not just come to a church. Does that make sense to you? More than returning to worship indoors, let us return to God with our whole hearts this year and worship him with our minds, our souls, and our whole being. This coming Saturday in our nation's capital, there will be a spiritual gathering of Christian leaders, speakers across the land, encouraging. And their heart cry is that as a nation, we return to God as individuals and collectively. This year, we have all grieved. We've all lost a way of life, at least for a while. And maybe we took the opportunity to worship for granted a bit. I thought about that this week. Maybe we will value even more the gift. The people who have been taken down to Babylon longed for the opportunity to worship again there in Jerusalem. And God gave them that opportunity. He gave some of them that opportunity. Maybe we will value that even more when we're able to be in close fellowship with one another once again. This psalm teaches us that grief is real. So how do we grieve well when loss happens? How do we actually benefit from grief and not be destroyed by it? We've already covered it. Very practical application here. When grief comes to you as a result of a loss experienced in your life, sit down. So many of us get busy with activity. We want to run from grief. We want to do everything we can to, feel, to, to not feel it, to not experience it. But I want to encourage you to sit down and experience what has happened in your life. When loss comes to you of something significant and of great value, sit down and reflect for just a moment. And allow yourself to experience the emotion of that cry if you need to. Remember what you've lost and mourn for it, long for it, speak of its great worth and value. Those are very practical and important things to do and this Psalm so clearly lays out the heart of a grieving person. If justice is called for, Pour out your heart to God and leave vengeance with him. Remember, O oh Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Now, who are the Edomites anyway? Anybody? You're biblical scholars. Edomites were descendants of Esau. Oh, somebody around here is 
a biblical student. Israel descended from Jacob. Thank you. Did I get that right? <laughs> I did get that right, didn't I, Greg? The Edomites were the descendants. They were kin. Are you kidding me? The kin of Israel were cheering on the destroyers of their brethren. Do you feel what that feels like to have a family member cheering when you're suffering? And so they said, remember, oh Lord, they took that hurt, that brokenness to the right place. And I said a while ago, you may feel these feelings, but handle them in the right way and say, Lord, remember, you remember, you deal with, you take care of. And the truth is, God is a God of justice. And he will make all things right in due time. You don't have to. And I don't have to. And that frees you up. And that frees me up. But finally and most importantly in this application. When you lose and when you grieve. By all means. Write it. Speak it. Say it. Express it. In some means, no matter how raw, no matter how real it may be, grief expressed is grief shared. It's not just a me. It's not just how I'm experiencing, but now it's a we. Others can enter into your grief when you express it. And those who wrote this song help us to enter in what it's like to really grieve. The loss of something very important. Grief expressed is grief shared and grief shared is grief diminished it's been said that sorrows among friends shared are sorrows divided and joys among friends are joys multiplied or it's greater in grief there is a we for one's loss affects many in grief there's also a me and one's loss is very much one's own journey to a foreign and strange land of the unfamiliar. And the people of God remembered and appreciated all that they had lost. And the time did come. It did come when their cruel captors and tormentors, Babylon, was overthrown. And God had a plan of healing and restoration and a time when their song would be restored. And they took those harps down off those poplars and took them back to Jerusalem with them. You can read about their return in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And listen, when they sang again, they sang in such a way that it had never been before. For their hearts and their songs to the Lord were perfectly tuned. They had not only returned to Jerusalem, but they had returned to the God that they worshipped. Loss does something. It causes us to evaluate what's very important. And listen, there is life after loss. There is singing after sighing. There is hope after despair. And God never abandons those he loves. He did not abandon his people in Babylon. He continued to send them word of hope through the prophets. Word to remind them that they were still his people. And that there would be an end to this time of suffering. There are things in life that we don't understand, but one day we will. Some losses seem too great to bear without the help of a great Savior. And fortunately, we don't have to bear the losses of life without a great Savior. Amen. And that's the important thing to keep in mind. Psalm 34. Let me give you two more verses. Psalm 34, verses 18 and 19. Write these down because they might be good for you to hold on to. Tuck in your Bible somewhere. Maybe in the front of your Bible, because there will be times when you are broken and when you are crushed in this life, there will be. But remember this, the psalmist tells us, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Aren't you glad we have a God who cares about us? Do you feel the depth of God's love in that? 
The Lord is near to those of a broken heart. Listen, it doesn't say that your heart won't be broken in this life, but it does say that the Lord is near to you when your heart is broken. So keep that in mind, will you? It's very important. And your afflictions may be many right now, even though you are righteous, but know this, that the Lord will deliver you. He is your deliverer. He's going to give you a victory. If not now, trust me, in the future, in a blink. Maybe you have lost someone you love, or maybe you're grieving someone or something that no one knows about. Psalm 137, I believe God allowed to be included, included inspired to be included to help us enter into and express our own grieving hearts, no matter how raw or how real they may be. Can you feel the depth of God's love for you? Never, ever forget that. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And he invites us to pour out our hearts to him. Will you join me as we pray? Let's talk to him. Father, we come before you this morning as people who live in a world that is sometimes filled with blessing and sometimes filled with hurt and pain and loss. And your word time and again is there to instruct us and to guide us and to remind us that others have walked paths of great loss before us and have come to you and poured out their hearts and described exactly what it feels like to have great loss. And some of us, maybe in this moment, also need to come to you. And maybe there are expressions that we have not shared with anyone, but this morning we would share them with you in these quiet moments. And I thank you that you are a God who hasn't left us alone. In fact, Jesus, you promised to never leave nor forsake us, that you would send a spirit, your spirit, to come and make his home with us. And so we're reminded that your spirit is here this morning. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth and to welcome your presence when our hearts are broken. And we just want to say we love you and thank you for walking this journey with us. In Christ's name, amen. Maybe for the first time you would say this morning, I want to walk with a God who does that, who enters into the brokenness of my life. And I've always thought of God way out there somewhere, not near at all, too far from me to even hear me, but I've been reminded. And, or maybe just for the first time you would say, I just want to receive this God as Lord of my life and walk with him. Whatever God has spoken to you as you stand to your feet, will you just speak that to him? I'd love for you to tell me that or maybe speak to Pastor Joshua as we finish up today this morning and let us know of any decisions that you've made so we can pray for you more thoroughly and directly and intentionally. Let's stand together and as we sing, be reminded of God's great love for you. Let's sing together. <laughs>
Amen? I don't have to understand it all right now. I understand one thing, that God is good. And God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. As you head out this morning, uh, remind you, uh, take a few minutes and bask in the warmth of the sunshine. Um, and uh, if you are going to be close together, thank you for just uh, putting on your face covering. Thank you for doing that. Um, remind you of Bible study groups uh, that will be meeting, uh, Brother Holman, here for your group. Uh, in, in the fellowship hall, uh, you'll be slipping over there for our older adult group. Uh, not old, just older adult group, uh, our ladies group. Uh, we'll also be meeting around the corner, or uh, Amelia will help guide you to that. And then our children are still on the front porch. Joshua, where do you want to meet? You on the top hill right there. Okay, so you, you'll be on the hill right over there. So thank you uh, for that. May God bless you and keep you. Let me pray for us as we close. Lord, we leave this place with the warmth of sun after a cool morning uh, just uh, shining down upon us. And may we walk in your light. I thank you for how wise and how good you are. Uh, how perfect all of creation is. It sings of you. It reminds us of you. And so I pray that we would walk in that this week in the truly sense of being surrounded by your presence and goodness wherever we go, walking in your light. In the wonderful name of Christ, amen and amen. May God bless you. Go in peace.